Hello listeners, this is the second part of the talk on living in Taiwan. This is the cons part of living in Taiwan. Now, of course, because it's the cons, it's going to be a somewhat negative talk. I, I'm going to try not to make it sound like I hate living here. I, I don't hate living here. I actually really like living in Taiwan. There are a handful of things that I wish I could change, and if I could, I'd be extremely happy here. Um, but nevertheless, you know, no place is perfect. Every place has uh, good and bad points. And I didn't want to uh, paint the the picture of Taiwan to be um, some sort of utopian uh, wonderland uh, just by doing the prose part. So the cons, please bear in mind that, that I'm not trying to be too negative. I'm just trying to uh, allow you to be somewhat well informed. Okay, so the cons. The first con, and, and probably the biggest really, I think for any foreigner in Taiwan, is the language barrier. Some people manage to pick the language up really well and so on, but you know, maybe those people, are, they either work very hard or they're very um, gifted at languages, but the language barrier is quite significant, I believe. Uh, the grammar in Chinese, and, and when I say Chinese here, I'm talking about Mandarin Chinese, basically. Uh, the grammar in Chinese is pretty simple, actually. They don't have um, a lot of the really complex concepts that are present in many Indo-European languages, so verb conjugations, noun declensions, which we fortunately don't have in English any longer that we used to in a long time ago, um, and, and all of that kind of stuff. Those things are absent in Chinese, so often the grammar is, is quite simple. Um, and some of the time it actually follows the same word order as in English. Um, in English, a very common structure of a sentence is subject, verb, object, and that's often true in Chinese also. So the grammar is not really the hard part about Chinese. Um, there are a few things that are difficult. Uh, one is that it's tonal. So there are a whole lot of syllables that um, only differ in that the pitch of your voice changes. And that makes all the difference. And that's something that's very foreign to to people who, who speak an Indo-European language. We don't have that in English. And so it can be hard to get your head around that. It can be a little bit um, hard to distinguish the tones at times. You get better at it, though. I'm by no means perfect at this point. Um, and then there are cognates. The vocabulary is, is a problem. Cognates are... Uh, words in different languages, or uh, I guess even within a language, that share a common origin. So an example of that might be, um, well, lots of lots of very simple words in Indo-European languages are related, numbers, colours, uh, family members, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so an, a, a, a classic example of that might be something like um, colours. So in English we have blue, and in French it's bleu, and in German it's blau. And so you can see the connection there between blue and blur, or blue and blau. And they, that's not the case between English and Chinese because they're not related to one another. So that's, that's simply not true in Chinese. And that means that you don't have all these hooks that you can kind of uh, latch onto in, in Chinese uh, that, that you would have in learning an Indo-European language, for instance. So, so that means that you basically have to learn everything from scratch. All of the vocabulary has to be from scratch. There are a handful of loan words, and they're just words that have been taken directly from English to Chinese. And there are actually a few that have gone the other way, like typhoon, tycoon. They're words taken from Chinese to English. Uh, but basically, you're going to have to learn every word from scratch, pretty much, which m means it's harder, obviously. And then, of course, there's the writing. The writing is, is a very inefficient way of writing, and it takes a long time to learn. Um, so that you know that makes it extremely difficult as well. Um, now, a few a few further points on um, the language barrier. Uh, it is possible to learn Chinese here. Obviously, I mean anyone can learn a language um, to one degree or another. But many foreigners don't because they find themselves caught in a Western bubble or Western ghetto, uh, particularly because most of them tend to. Uh, teach English, so they go to work at a language school. The Taiwanese staff there all speak um, English to one degree or another. They have foreign colleagues there, and they're 
if not um, uh, prohibited from speaking Chinese to the children, then they're actively discouraged from doing so. And, and you know, sometimes that can be quite absurd because you know, a little kid can be trying to express something to you and, you know, you can understand it in Chinese. Um, and, 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 you know, you're not allowed to speak Chinese to, to that kid, but the kid can't say it to you in English or doesn't understand what you're trying to say back in English. It can be a little bit absurd sometimes. Uh, but nevertheless, many foreigners can find themselves caught in a bubble and never progress with any Chinese. My Chinese is by no means perfect. I wouldn't say I'm fluent or anything. I can sort of converse well enough. Um, and, and, you know, get my, my points across, get my needs covered. But um, many foreigners aren't in that position. And, and I've met lots of foreigners who have been here for years and years and years and who can literally do no more than order a, a beer, that kind of thing. Um, and, of course, the more of a language you speak, the more entry points you have into uh, other aspects of the culture and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that can be a problem. And actually... Chinese will, uh, sorry, Taiwanese will um, compliment you on your Chinese if you say anything. They're, they're quite generous in that regard. Um, and then you, you can learn Chinese um, in a formal setting. I actually haven't, I've, this is only second-hand information from a lot of friends. I, I've um, taught myself from books or from speaking to kids and that kind of thing. Um, but the people I have known who have gone through that system have said it's, it's pretty hard going. Um, the way they teach it is, is uh, there's a high attrition rate because it's extremely dry. It's really academic the way they teach it. They don't necessarily teach things that are going to be useful. And um, they put a huge emphasis upon writing. You know, there are four skills, right? Speaking, listening, writing and reading. And um, writing is... is I think it's probably the, the least important of the four, uh, and it definitely shouldn't occupy 25% of your time as a language learner. Uh, and, and yet they put a huge emphasis upon it here, and you know, I think a lot of foreigners get frustrated because they just want to be able to go and order a meal in a restaurant, and instead they're you know, writing all these characters. Um, so that can be hard going, from what I've heard from friends. Um, a quick note about writing. There are actually two different systems of writing with Chinese. Um, well, there are, there are others. There are sort of archaic forms as well. But there are basically two modern forms. There are traditional characters and simplified characters. Traditional characters are used in Taiwan. Simplified characters are used in China. And the simplified characters are as they sound. They, they're simplified versions of the traditional characters. So they have fewer strokes... There's a large overlap between the two. Um, characters that are not very complex will often be the same in both both systems of writing, but the more complex a, a traditional character is, the more likely it is that it's going to have a simplified version. And, I mean, that's not a problem if you just come here and start learning the language like that, but uh, a lot of people who, who, or I guess probably almost all people who learn um, Chinese in the West will learn... Uh, simplified characters and then they'll come to Taiwan and the simplified characters won't really be very much used to them because everything's written in traditional characters. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, what else do I have on that? Okay, yes, English. Um, the, the level of English in Taiwan can be a bit hit and miss. In Taipei, it's obviously much better, but, you know, people tend to be more educated, they're more professionals and so on there, and it's sort of a status thing. Uh, but if, if you're not dealing with people who are um, not professionals or not white-collar workers in Taipei, you'll have some problems. Um, and pretty much the farther you get away from Taipei or other major cities, the, the worse the English becomes, and it drops off quite rapidly, actually. Um, so that can be a problem in Taiwan. Um, and the general level of English, even amongst people who are quite um, well-educated and so on, I would say it's not at the level of Northern Europeans. Uh, so for those of you who have ever met Dutch or Danes or Swedes, their English is actually really good. In many cases, it's, it's better than um, that of native speakers. It's, it's not even remotely close to that level here in Taiwan. 
um, it's significantly um, below that. Um, and I mean, that's to do with their language. It's so different. There, there are a, a lot of um, a lot of the the way they think about the language in Chinese gets sort of translated directly into English. So there's a lot of Chinglish. And that's um, that that's really evident in uh, written English. A lot of things are signposted, um, but sometimes it's a bit. It's a bit awkward, the phrasing. Um, sometimes it's indecipherable. Generally, you can get the gist, but sometimes you can't. Um, and uh, just one other point on language. Uh, young people all speak Chinese. They might not speak it as their first language because there are other Chinese dialects spoken here, Taiwanese, most obviously. Um, also, something called Hakka, which is a sort of a, a language, and it's also a um, sort of sub-ethnic group or cultural group within um, greater China, the Chinese speaking world um, and some people speak Aboriginal languages but basically everyone learns Chinese at school that, that's the language of instruction at school um, but some older people do not speak Chinese or they don't speak it well um, they'll tend to speak one of those other languages um, and, and there is some sort of uh, regional accents and so on in different parts of Taiwan um, but generally speaking, you'll get by on, with Chinese. If, if you can speak Chinese, you'll get by. All right, so the next con is um, in t um, sometimes it can be difficult getting Western items. It really depends on what you're after. It's a bit of a cliche with, with um, foreigners here. They'll often talk about how they can't get clothes that fit. I don't know where, where these people are shopping or, who, you know, maybe these people are all you know, ex-NBA players or something. Uh, but I'm 186 centimetres, which is six foot one, which is slightly taller than average, and I have never had any problems buying anything off the rack or walking into a shoe store and uh, saying, I, I want those shoes in this size. Um, I've never had any problems with, with finding things that fit. Um, and there are lots of tall Taiwanese people now. The older generations... They were malnourished in many cases, and so their, their growth was stunted. But there are tons of young people, not as many as in the West, but still tons of young people who are quite tall. So I've never had a real issue with that. Some foreigners do complain about that. I think it's probably more the case that they can't get particular fashions, because fashion here is different to, well, e even within Asia it's different, uh, but, you know, it's different to the West, certainly. Uh, but, you know, if, if you want sort of really famous brands, Levi's or Nike or something, you can get that stuff here easily. Um, so you, you won't tend to have problems with, with clothing. Food might be an issue. Um, there are, there's a, there's a chain of supermarkets, a French chain called Carrefour, and they have a, a foreign food section, and you can get, you know, pasta and that kind of stuff there. Obviously, if you want a particular brand of obscure chocolate bar or something, from where, wherever you're from, well, you're not going to find that or in the unlikely event that you can find it at some sort of specialty store. It will probably cost more, but that's true of anything that's imported. Um, but, you know, pretty much they have everything. Uh, of course, if you're in small towns, you're not going to necessarily find everything you want, but that's true anywhere in the world. Um, but some foreigners do complain about not being able to find this thing or that thing. I don't know. I mean, you have to... You have to uh, you know, be willing to adapt and say, well, you know, I'm not going to get, you know, my favourite childhood food here, that kind of thing. Um, what else have I got on that topic? Uh, I mean, pretty much everything else you should be okay with, actually, um, in terms of e e electronics, things like that. Books, sometimes uh, Western books can be hard. Big CCs have um, stores that have Western books. You won't necessarily be able to get everything you want, but then, I don't know, you could buy a Kindle or something and get e-books. Um, uh, and, and buying books from, from um, buying English language books, you know, going and buying a novel or something like that, it's probably more expensive. I haven't bought one for ages here. Um, it's, it's probably more expensive than if you were to buy it in the West. Um, but again, you know, imported items are, right? Uh, but basically they'll have most things you want. Um, Eating out is probably where you might have some, some issues with food. Um, and there are a couple of things there. Uh, the first one is that 
there's not necessarily the diversity that you, you might be used to in terms of cuisine. Where I'm from, Melbourne, is a very multicultural city. Um, you know, you can pretty much find food from anywhere in the world in Melbourne. Uh, but, you know, that's because it's settled by massive numbers of immigrants. Well, Taiwan doesn't have that in terms of immigration, so of course they don't have the, the same uh, eating options. Um, you can find Mexican restaurants or Indian restaurants, Middle Eastern restaurants in Taipei and other big cities. Uh, if you want something kind of obscure, I don't know if you want um, an Argentinian steakhouse or something like that, I don't know, Kazakhstani banquet hall or something, um, you, might, you might have some issues there. Um, but basically you can get anything East Asian, so Korean, Japanese, all the different varieties of Chinese food. You can get all of that stuff here. Um, and Southeast Asian food too, because there are quite a number of Southeast Asians here, so you can find that stuff. Uh, but basically the, 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 the farther away you move from East Asia, the harder it becomes. Um, and sometimes the food is not really authentic. There are quite a few places that are run by foreigners here. Uh, some places aren't, and so they always put their little spin on things. Every, every country does that. Every country that I've been to and um, had Chinese food in has had its own little spin on Chinese food. Uh, and my wife, when she went to Australia the first time and had some food that was supposedly Chinese, um, she sort of freaked out and said, you know, what the hell is this? Um, so some things are a little bit unusual here. They change them slightly. Uh, probably the, the, the most common is corn. They have a love affair with uh, that sort of diced corn, you know, the, the little corn kernels um, in the, the come in um, uh, tin cans. They have a love affair with that corn here, uh, and they put it on all sorts of strange things. So on pizza, for instance, sometimes not on every pizza, but on some pizzas, they they'll they'll put <laughs> diced corn, which is kind of novel. Um, so there'll be a few little surprises. They, they love mayonnaise here too. I don't know what the deal is with mayonnaise. Foreigners always complain that they can't get sour cream, uh, but Taiwanese have a real love affair with mayonnaise. Um, they'll put that in all sorts of things, sandwiches and, and everything. Um, so, you, you know, you, you'll have to adapt in terms of eating here. Um, and, and you may either love or hate Taiwanese cuisine. Um, I don't really have a problem with it. I like to eat different things now and then, um, and and uh, I'm not really a huge foodie, uh, but you know I do like to eat different things now and then. But I can I can live with it. You know I can deal with eating Taiwanese or Chinese food all the time. It's, it's all right. Some people can't. I've actually known some foreigners here who who just wouldn't touch it. Um, and, and they basically ate, they, they either cooked at home or they, um, they always ate at Western style establishments, which meant that it was often quite unhealthy because it was KFC or something like that, or, and or very expensive as well. Um, so that's silly, you know, eat the local food. Uh, yeah, that's probably it on the topic of food and, and getting certain things. Um, you know, it's a developed country. If you're in a big city, you'll, you'll probably be able to get what you want. Um, the next con, I think, is bad work opportunities. I'm probably going to make a, another talk that will solely deal with teaching English in Taiwan. So I'll just uh, sort of cover bullet points here on why I think English teaching isn't really a very good option. Uh, pretty much as anything other than a stepping stone to other things and fairly quickly. So here are the bullet points, basically. Uh, it can be exploitative, it has antisocial hours, there's no career progression, there have been stagnating wages for at least the past decade, if not longer. Um, it's caught, uh, you can find yourself caught in a bubble. It's not challenging intellectually most of the time, and often it just doesn't make any sense. It's very contradictory, a lot of the things that, that um, occur or that you're told to do, and so on. So I don't think English teaching is really that good an option, generally speaking. Um, now, some people end up here on expat packages, um, you know, where they, they set you up with a fancy apartment and give you a, a, um, pay for your children to attend international schools and so on. I'm not really talking about those kinds of people and those work opportunities. I'm talking about people who come here to actually work. 
um, and start a career here, that kind of thing. Basically, outside of teaching English, most other jobs will um, be on the periphery of, of teaching English. So they might be editing people's essays, that kind of stuff, or um, writing articles for English language magazines, that kind of thing. Um, there aren't really that many opportunities for people to work in Taiwan because generally speaking foreigners won't have the language skills and they also won't have the, the cultural um, uh, affinity or knowledge either and so you know why would employers here hire someone like that especially because m most foreigners would want to get paid more. I have actually known one guy who, who um, got a job as an engineer here a white guy, he was from Australia, he studied engineering at university and I believe he had a girlfriend in Australia for, for several years who, who was Taiwanese and she taught him Chinese and he could speak Chinese quite well. So he actually did get a job working as an engineer um, in Taiwan but of course the work culture is very different here so it's not, probably not even really suited to most Westerners. Um, so basically out of um, anything to do with English teaching, there are very few opportunities for foreigners unless they start their own business, which I spoke briefly about in the previous talk to this one. Um, those, those opportunities, is there, you know, there are a few people on TV and stuff, um, but generally speaking, not, not many really. Um, it's, it's English teaching. So I don't think working here is such a, a good option for most people. Um, all right, what do I have next? Ah, doing business with Taiwanese. Now, this is, um, I find it frustrating. I'm a very direct person, a, sort of a no-nonsense person. I'm not, I don't have really great people skills, I think. Um, and I find it difficult dealing with, with Taiwanese because I'm too direct for them and they're too indirect for me. Um, many Taiwanese can be very hard-nosed businessmen. Uh, it's not good to, to, um, be an employee of them or to sort of put yourself at their mercy uh, because they're very hierarchical and the role of the boss is, is uh, greatly um, uh, enhanced or expanded upon compared to in the West, which I discussed briefly in um, the talk about the, the series of pictures by Young Yo, the um, East, East, East Meets West or West Meets East, East Meets West, I think it was called. Um, that that talk that I did recently. Uh, so, you know, you don't want to really put yourself at the mercy of a boss here. That, that can be pretty hard. Um, and I find some people are just outright dishonest, and that, that's true everywhere, but it does seem to be a bit of a cultural thing. Or the people can be very flexible or economical with the truth. A lot of things are on a need-to-know basis, and you might think you need to know. In fact, you actually do need to know because you need to do this thing by 2 o'clock, and they won't tell you, or they tell you the wrong thing. Whether It's generally not intentional, um, but you know it can be frustrating because people can be very indirect um, in getting information out of them, or the right information can be very frustrating. Um, so I, I still have difficulties with that. My wife mostly deals with those kinds of things. Um, and then, sort of following on from that, Taiwanese are not very punctual at all. Um, they're usually late. Some are not, but generally they'll be late. And they won't necessarily warn you in advance. In fact, some, or they won't even warn you a lot of the times if they're going to cancel. Some people do, of course, but many don't. And so, um, or they'll they'll tell you after the fact. You know, they'll call you at um, two thirty to cancel a two o'clock meeting, that kind of thing. Um, and I find that frustrating. And and it's a little bit strange because they can catch a train on time, but they can't turn up to a meeting on time. I, I don't really know what the deal is with that. It can, it can be quite frustrating deal with dealing with them in that regard. And they can be very disorganised too. Um, even when they turn up, they don't necessarily know what they're doing. Um, they may start asking you a whole bunch of questions that you've already answered before, or they might, may not have what they need for the meeting, or they, they'll provide you with the wrong information for the meeting. I, I've had that so many times, uh, you know, when I've turned up to some sort of event or a tra sports training or something, and it's at a different venue, and they, 
they neglected to, to tell anyone, not just me, but other people also, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, everyone sort of has to make 10 different phone calls to eventually find out what we're meant to be doing where and at what time, that kind of thing. Um, and I, uh, in a, a job I once had, there were eight foreign teachers and um, eight Taiwanese teachers, and then there were some um, administrative staff, directors, and we used to have periodic meetings, and, and there, were always, um, there was always some degree of disorganisation involved. Uh, but on one particular occasion, the, the three directors arrived at the meeting, and of course they hadn't prepared any agenda for the meeting, so they then had a meeting about the meeting for 40 minutes. Um, they, they worked out what the agenda for the meeting was going to be, and the other 16 of us all just sort of sat there with you know, dumb looks on our faces, waiting for them to... Um, to, to sort their stuff out. Um, it was quite ridiculous, really. I mean, if you multiply 16 times 40 minutes, what's that? 640 minutes. So, you know, that's, that's pushing 11 hours worth of productivity they lost just by the fact that three of them couldn't get together and have a meeting beforehand, you know? Um, so, you know, it can be frustrating dealing with people and their lack of punctuality or their disorganisation and so on. Um, and I think many of them are not doing it maliciously. They're just actually really unaware. Um, and if you bring it up to them, they, they, they're not even aware that they've done it. Um, so that can be a bit of a hassle at times. Uh, what do I have next? The physical environment, the man-made environment. That can be hard going at times. Um, I mean, the population density really doesn't help. Um, you, you know, it's, the population density is mad here. Uh, particularly in the north. Um, so anything, any issues to do with the man-made environment are going to be exacerbated. And it's also to do with history in that um, they fled the mainland when they lost the Civil War in uh, 1948, I believe. They came over here and they had to just throw up a whole bunch of buildings all of a sudden to, to accommodate everyone. And then there was a huge baby boom that, that sort of... Um, uh, those people came of age, I guess, in the 70s, approximately. Uh, and so then they needed to build a whole lot of extra accommodation for those people, you know, because every family had five kids. So they needed to, you know, build a whole lot of more buildings there. Um, and that's slowed down now. But, but um, there are a lot of ugly buildings. There are a lot of buildings that are basically just concrete boxes, unadorned concrete boxes. And then... Um, maybe about 20 or 30 years ago, they started um, a trend where they they put what basically resembled bathroom tiles on the exterior of all buildings. So there are massive numbers of these these apartment buildings that have white or pink bathroom tiles essentially on the outside. They look like um, someone's bathroom that's been turned inside out. And they're, they're pretty ugly. And there's a lot of concrete in the natural environment. They sort of... Um, poured concrete in rivers and stuff like that. So sometimes it can be it can be hard going. The places that haven't been marred by that are absolutely beautiful, as I spoke about in the first talk. But sometimes you know the the urban planning and the architecture in a lot of the the, the roads and the, the towns have not been laid out well. Um, and and now everyone's getting a car, so the traffic congestion can be quite severe. In terms of pollution. Um, Oh, Taiwanese litter a lot. Um, that's that's one thing that, that sort of frustrates me. Um, but in terms of pollution, they're they're actually doing a lot to to cut back on that and to to make Taiwan much cleaner um, in terms of air, water, and soil pollution. Though every so often there's some sort of food scandal. Um, the main thing I find is the noise pollution, the light pollution. Everywhere you go, Taiwan is an extremely noisy place. People love making noise here. And they don't seem to... It doesn't seem to bother them. Um, they're really noisy. They shout at each other. People don't talk to each other. They scream at each other. And not because they're angry. That's just... Everything is sort of 50 decibels higher than it should be. And people let off fireworks at random times and stuff like that. So there can be quite a bit of noise pollution. Um, actually, I recorded this talk um, earlier today and um, the garbage truck was coming around. The garbage truck makes a lot of noise. It plays a song. Everyone can hear it from miles away because of this song. Um, and you could actually hear it really loudly on this recording, um, which is one of the reasons I already did this recording. So there's noise pollution. 
Um, and, and so all of that kind of stuff to do with bad architecture, urban planning, noise pollution, that sort of stuff. Um, that's, that's probably one of the main things I would like to change about Taiwan, if I could. It's changing in the north, apparently. But of course, that's always a double-edged sword, because in the first talk I spoke about how there isn't a nanny state here, and I suspect that to, to change those things here, they would have to bring in some sort of nanny state. So, you know, if, if, it, if it means um, more noise, but the government isn't sort of reading, you know, reading my emails or, you know, saying you can't have three dogs. I only have two, actually, but, you know, if I wanted a third, I could have 17 dogs in Taiwan if I wanted. Maybe I will, you know, and I'll go and you know, show someone who works in the, at the local council at my parents' house a photo of my 17 dogs. Um, but, you know, I guess that's the trade-off, right? People do some sort of annoying things at times um, because the government doesn't um, get on everyone's case about them. Nevertheless, it, it can be a bit of a hassle. I'm, I'm somewhat sensitive to that stuff. Um, and then the next thing, which is also another thing that I would really like to change, is the driving in Taiwan. Driving is pretty crazy here. It's not as crazy as many other countries, uh, but it's sort of definitely uh, crazier than the West. Um, there are a lot of scooters. People have cars as well, um, but there are a lot of scooters. The scooters are pretty hectic. I, I used to ride a scooter. I don't anymore. I had quite a few accidents on scooters. I have a few scars as a result. Ironically, most of them were at low speed, um, sort of losing the back wheel when I, I went through some oil or water or something on a curve. Um, but the scooters are death traps, and people drive them like they're in a video game. Um, you have to be really aware of them if you're driving a car. Uh, and... Car, people who drive cars and trucks and other large vehicles often do quite reckless things. So they'll overtake on the crest of a hill, they'll overtake on a blind corner, they'll overtake through a construction site, they'll overtake when there's really heavy rain, and sometimes you know they'll sort of try to get all four in one. Um, that can be quite quite nerve wracking at times. Um, you know, seeing a big truck um, coming over the hill in your lane, straight towards you. Um, so I wish they would change that. Though, again, you know, the police don't sort of get on everyone's cases. People more or less seem to survive. I mean, I do see scooter accidents here and there. Um, but more or less people tend to, to be able to manage this hectic driving, um, even if it's a little bit scary at times. Uh, and people do strange things like they'll drive down the wrong side of the road. They, they drive on the right-hand side of the road here. And every so often you'll see someone, usually scooters, but occasionally a car, on the wrong side of the road just because they don't want to have to sort of do a U-turn, then drive half a kilometre down the road to find um, uh, one of those points where you can turn and do another U-turn and then come back and then turn down an alleyway. They'll just say, oh, it's only 50 metres, I'll just, I'll just quickly dash down there. And, you know. and so occasionally you'll see someone driving a truck or something down the wrong side of the road. Uh, not, not in Taipei, they're really strict on that kind of stuff, but... The farther away from Taipei you go, the more likelihood there is that you'll see something like that, or you know, a whole family on a scooter, or you know, multiple dogs and people. Um, they hook up these um, hand trolleys, you know, those little hand trolleys that, that um, delivery men use to deliver boxes. They hook those up to the back of a scooter, and then they'll they'll have half a dozen huge gas bottles, you know, for people's restaurants or homes or something um, on the back of one of these trolleys. It's really precarious. Um, they do all sorts of crazy things here. You'll see, you'll see um, in the countryside a lot of women with babies strapped to their backs, with, um, yeah, riding scooters doing you know, 50 kilometres an hour. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, so the, the driving's a bit, a bit nerve-wracking at times. I wish they, they could sort of sort that out a little bit. Um, the next issue is Taiwan can be rough around the edges at times. You know, in some ways it's really developed, um, and Taipei is really developed. Um, you know, they have a, a world-class subway system, the MRT. The subway system in Taipei has won all sorts of awards, and they have a high-speed rail, and there's Wi-Fi everywhere, free Wi-Fi and all this kind of stuff. But in other ways, things can be a bit um, jury-built, particularly out in the countryside. Uh, near one of our businesses, um, there are a whole lot of farms around that business, and um, 
There's one farm, we actually know the people who own the farm. They, it's on a plateau that's about three or four metres high, the plateau, and the edges sort of slope down from the plateau. And at the bottom of the um, plateau, there's an irrigation ditch, and it has a wall for part of it. It doesn't have a wall the whole way. Uh, th so there's an irrigation ditch, and then on the other side of the ditch, there's the road. And so this guy we know, he, um, for a long time he wasn't really doing anything with the land, but earlier this year he decided he wanted to grow some dragon fruit there. And dragon fruit, they're pretty cool plants. They look like um, like cacti. And they train them on a sort of a trellis type thing. So he built a big metal fence around the property, presumably to stop people from eventually stealing his dragon fruit. Um, and the fence, you know, it was all sort of, uh, the, the, the ground was quite soft. They, they had tilled this ground. So supporting the fence, he had um, metal poles that went down off the plateau down towards the irrigation ditch. And in most places, there were uh, sort of metal stakes that had been driven into the ground, resting against the, uh, the irrigation ditch and the, the, the concrete edge. And then the metal poles were welded to those at the bottom. In some places, however, um, there wasn't a wall for the irrigation ditch. So they had just piled a whole lot of rocks, you know, a dozen rocks over the end of the, the poles. Um, and then at other points, the poles came off his fence and he had welded them onto the telephone poles, onto the metal, onto um, metal bars sticking out of the telephone poles. I don't know how he could sort of get away with that. But so you see things like that um, that are a little bit strange, a little bit dodgy. Um, and another one, uh, one of my pet peeves is the, um, what I call the, the half inch step or the three quarter inch step. Um, a lot of the, the roads, the footpaths, the, the pavements or sidewalks are really uneven. And a lot of buildings have these purposely built steps. I think, I've never really got a, 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 an adequate explanation on about this, but I think it's basically so that there's a slightly raised area, it's usually at schools or, or, or government buildings, um, so that if there's a big typhoon or there's other heavy rain, people can go somewhere where they'll be above the, the rain that's running down the, 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 um, the pavement or the, the um, sort of open corridor or the steps or whatever. So they have this little raised area and, and it's always only about half an inch high or three quarters of an inch high. It's really deceptive and multiple times I've twisted my ankle because of this step. I haven't noticed it at, until the last moment and then I've rolled my ankle. It's really annoying and, and, it's not, and often it's not even um, level with the ground. One end will be slightly higher than the other or there'll be a, a sort of an, it will undulate. Um, some of the, the concrete work is not so good. Um, so you, you see things like that, older things or things in the countryside that are a little bit badly built and they don't, they don't pay attention to detail generally in Taiwan. So that's a bit of an issue. Um, it can be rough around the edges the farther away you go from Taipei. Um, but mostly I can deal with that. The next issue is another thing I would actually probably really like to change, and it's the climate. Obviously, I can't change the climate, but I would like to. Um, April and October, October are both really nice months. Um, spring and autumn. The weather is beautiful in Taiwan in those months. But the rest of the year, it's, I really dislike it. So now it's summer. It's um, July. And it's just brutally hot and the humidity just um, makes it crazy. Last week I went to do some sports training at a um, sports centre and afterwards, it was about 8.20 in the evening, I went outside and there was a clock and um, there was also a thermometer and a, um, oh, what do they call those things for, for um, humidity, I can't remember. Anyway, um, and... It was uh, 34 degrees and 99% humidity at 8.20 in the evening, and it was just brutal. I was just, my, my whole t-shirt, I, I had changed clothes. Um, my my t-shirt looked like I had just pulled it out of a washing machine. It was just, I was just dripping. Um, and then on the weekend, I went to another sporting thing, and we didn't do that much um, activity. It was mostly some guys um, talking to us about some stuff. And um, 
In, in three and a half hours I drank three litres of water and on that day I must have had about six or seven litres of water and I was absolutely destroyed the next day when I woke up just from being so dehydrated the whole day. I just couldn't stay hydrated. Um, so the, the, the humidity here is just brutal in summer and conversely it's also brutal in winter uh, because the air always feels moist. It always feels much colder than it actually is. It, it only gets down to about 10 degrees, 15 degrees. So it doesn't get really cold, but the humidity makes everything feel really cold. If you ride a scooter, you'll be really cold. Um, and it's not aided by the, the way they build structures here, buildings. Um, they don't insulate them at all. And so in winter, they're basically like little refrigerators or freezers and you'll you'll be sitting in an office wearing three or four layers of clothes and still shivering um and in summer those those buildings are like um saunas so I, I, that's something i really just like about the way they build buildings here they don't insulate them i think they're starting to change some of the the, the buildings but more or less they're still built in the same the same way it's just the cosmetic details um and they don't um take advantage of um a sort of passive solar effects for heating or cooling, that kind of stuff. They just don't do that. Um, so it's very uncomfortable. The weather can be really uncomfortable. I think it's my northern European genes that, that really make me struggle because the locals don't seem to struggle as much. Um, they certainly don't sweat any near, anywhere near as much as I do. Another issue to do with the climate is typhoons. It's typhoon season now. Summer is typhoon season in Taiwan. Um, and there are usually a few each year. Typhoons are um, the same thing as hurricanes or, or cyclones. Um, if you haven't lived around them, they, they, I mean, you get a day off work or a day off school in Taiwan, but they're generally really inconvenient because everything closes down and um, people sort of shutter their, their doors and windows and so on. Um, and, and even still, you can end up with water in your house. Um, and it's really dangerous to go outside because it's extremely windy and, and wet and, you know, driving is dangerous. Uh, so typhoons are a bit of a hassle. Um, actually, our honeymoon, my wife and I, when we got married, our honeymoon was delayed by a day because the typhoon um, arrived and, and we, we couldn't fly out. So that was really frustrating. That's when we went to Iceland, so I missed out on one day in Iceland as a result. Um, yeah, and another thing, this isn't to do with the climate, but it's a natural phenomenon, is earthquakes. They do have earthquakes in Taiwan. It's um, along that whole line of, uh, the, what's it called, the, the Ring of Fire. Basically, they don't have active volcanoes, but they have earthquakes. I've never experienced a big one here. The last big one was, was quite a long time ago. Um, I think a decade, or more than a decade ago, I think. Um, but when they do get big ones, um, there's a, there are some problems because a lot of the builders are a bit dodgy and they cut some corners and so on, so things fall down. Um, yeah, the, but the, the earthquakes I have experienced, they can be a little bit disconcerting if you're not used to earthquakes. Um, yeah, so the natural phenomena I'm not such a big fan of. Um, all right, what's next on my list? Uh, all right, uh, there is a very different way of thinking here. And... As I discussed in the, the prose part, that can be very good because there's social harmony and so on. But in other ways, um, because they're very hierarchical and they're very much into social order and so on, it can be frustrating in two ways. One is if they do something that doesn't make much sense, often you'll, you can say to them, why don't you do it this way? And they'll say, because that's how we do it. Um, and they won't, they won't adapt their way of doing things at times. Um, and they can be very sort of status quo thinking on many things people don't like to rock the boat and that's good most of the time but it does mean that when there are injustices or when um when someone is willing to transgress social mores they often get away with it because other people won't say anything to them um and and there's a, an absurd situation that i encounter relatively often where if someone is being an idiot and you say hey stop being an idiot stop doing that you then become the idiot for daring to call them an idiot. And everyone will look at you and think, you know, look at this guy. He's, you know, sh shame on him. That's really strange um, for me. Uh, but that's, I've encountered that so many times with so many people. And I still get that with my wife sometimes. Um, that, that 
someone else can be doing something wrong and you pointing it out then makes you the bad guy. It's kind of a strange situation, um, but it's very common in Taiwan um, that that can be the case. Um, and, and further to that, um, the Taiwanese, they, they can be very uh, nice and friendly and naive in good ways sometimes, but they can also be very parochial, particularly outside of Taipei. Um, you know, they can very much live in their own little world and, and not know anything about the rest of the world. And most of the time it's not negative, it, it's fairly benign, but sometimes it can be um, slightly frustrating dealing with, with very parochial thinking. Uh, you know, there's a stereotype of Americans not knowing anything else about the world um, other than America. Well, I think that is much worse for Taiwanese, I think. Um, Taiwanese really know nothing about the world. Uh, I mean, literally, you can show them a map of East Asia or Southeast Asia, they, and they can't find South Korea, or they can't find uh, Vietnam on on a map of Asia. Um, and and what they tend to know about other countries um, is often extremely stereotypical. It's what they receive from Hollywood and that kind of thing. And there can be all sorts of weird misconceptions about people from um, different parts of the world. So that can be slightly frustrating at times. Mostly it's okay, but it can be annoying. Um, and this leads on to a series of um, sort of deeper issues that I have with Taiwan. I've, I've mostly made my peace with these issues, but every so often they, they get to me. The first of which is um, it can be very difficult to form deeper relations with Taiwanese. Uh, sometimes that's to do with the language barrier, but even aside from the language barrier, they just don't have the same cultural influences. Um, people often take it for granted that everyone around them knows certain things, you know, about music or movies or television shows or events, political events, that kind of thing, books, all of that sort of stuff. But that's, you, you actually can't take that for granted. Many years ago before I came to Taiwan, before I even thought about coming to Taiwan and didn't really know much about Taiwan, I actually knew a few, few Taiwanese people at university and uh, I was in a club, and um, we were doing a fundraiser to send some people interstate for a sporting competition. And uh, some of us put together a cover band, and, and we were just playing some sort of golden oldies kind of stuff. And I was speaking to, to this Taiwanese girl about this, and she said, oh, so, you know, what are you going to play? And I, I mentioned different stuff, and then I said, the Beatles. And she said, what do you mean, the, you know, what's the Beatles? Who are they? And I said, what, what, what do you mean? Don't you know who the Beatles are? And she said, no. And I think, um, you know, if, if you took any kind of middle class white person in the where, you know, in, in the Anglosphere, they'd probably know the Beatles. Maybe some really young people wouldn't, but I think probably anyone over the age of 20 would. Uh, but you can't take that kind of thing for granted. You can't take it for granted that you could mention Star Wars or the, um, I don't know, Rocky movies or something or you know, the Godfather or something like that. You, you can't really take it for granted that people will know that kind of stuff. I mean, many people in the West don't know much about cultural history or anything either, but you certainly can't take it for granted here. And of course, they, you know, they have a really old civilization here. It's one of the world's great civilizations. And they have a whole lot of other um, cultural issues and so on here. They're, they're their own culture. So of course, uh, they're going to be into that. But that does mean that sometimes, even if you can speak to someone, even if you speak Chinese or they speak English, um, it can be difficult to really find to find people with whom you can have a deeper relationship. It tends to, the conversations tend to occur at a very superficial level, even for people that you might have known for quite a long time, or they, um, they uh, can end up being a bit like an English lesson, um, that kind of thing. Um, Maybe I've just met the wrong people, but I, I don't think so. I, th I think that is a, a genuine issue um, that, that I haven't had with other Westerners. You know, I can meet, um, you know, someone from the US or someone from Germany or something, and and you know, if they're not if they're not really dumb, um, I can converse with them about different issues and have a, a you know a, kind of an in-depth discussion about politics or philosophy or something. That's not really true here. Um, yeah, there are, of course, there are educated people, but um, 
you know, those those people are into their own things most of the time. Um, and the mass of the great mass of people just really want to talk about, you know, whatever's on Taiwanese television, um, which is not interesting to me at all. So that can be difficult. Um, and leasing on from that, I actually find it difficult to form relationships with foreigners here um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, I don't live in a big city, so it can be difficult to meet them. Um, but secondly, because... I don't, I don't find many foreigners here interesting, actually. Um, there are a lot of... Because, because of the English teaching industry, it's quite a strange industry. You can make reasonable money from it, but it can be very exploitative. And so um, it tends to, if, if not attract, but, well, certainly retain uh, a lot of misfits, a lot of guys who have sort of done the rounds in Asia. They're in their 40s or, or beyond, um, they're sort of dysfunctional. They, they might be alcoholic or something like that, um, and and you know people who can be a bit sketchy in general. And then younger people. I mean, I'm getting on a bit. I'm 39, so I don't really have much in common with your average 22-year-old, obviously. And also, um, I th I think younger people are far more liberal than than people from previous generations. And I think also um, there is something about travel that, that tends to be more of a liberal person's um, activity. I mean, I have met some very interesting right-wing people whilst travelling, but generally speaking, most right-wing people, they're very much into the place they're from and the culture they're from, and, and they're happy with that. They don't really want to leave that. So I suspect it tends to be more liberal people who travel. And, you know, you get a lot of these guys who... They're just um, rolling out the usual talking points from their, their professors or you know whatever they studied at university and being incredibly politically correct and so on. And there are a lot of degenerates here as well, young degenerates. Um, I, I don't find those people very interesting, actually. Um, I find them degenerate or boring. So, you know, if, you, if you're some sort of old curmudgeon like, like I am, that can be difficult as well. Um, I'm sure there are actually a lot more... Um, conservative or reactionary people here, foreigners here, but they, ten, they tend to keep quite a low profile, I think, as, as they tend to in the West as well, to a certain extent, because they don't, um, they don't want to be the odd man out, that kind of thing. Um, they, they're the minority, and I think they're aware of it, and so they tend to sort of keep their heads down. I actually met one guy, I had met him a, a couple of times already, um, he lives not that far from me and in some ways he's liberal but in other ways he's not and um, I had known him for a few months and we had sort of danced around a few issues and then one day I just sort of came out with a whole lot of stuff and he did as well and uh, you know, I found out that we, we had a lot of very similar opinions on, on all sorts of issues um, but you know it can be difficult to meet people like that here um, so you know that's a that's a problem at times, um, and and further to those kinds of issues in general, you're, you're pretty much always going to be an outsider, and I don't mind that in many ways. I like the fact that Taiwan is, you know, that basically to be Taiwanese is to be Han Chinese or or Aboriginal. Um, I like that that it's a more or less a mono ethnic monocultural society, uh, because. You know, they haven't been enriched by the, uh, the wondrous benefits of diversity, you know, with um, suicide bombers and terrorists and, um, you know, uh, rape gangs of uh, 1,400 girls in small English towns and all of that kind of stuff, as is happening in the West at the moment. They haven't been enriched by all of that. So, um, you know, that's really good. But that also means that, that you'll always be an outsider because to be Taiwanese is, is not to be white, basically. Um, and so you'll always be an outsider, more or less. Some people will be accepted to one degree or another, but, but not wholesale. It's not a proposition nation like, uh, like many Western nations now are. So that, that can be a problem. It's, it's not really for me. I actually like being an outsider, even, even aside from that, because um, one thing about being an insider is, is in the instances when, when I am an insider, I feel... Um, somehow more responsible for certain things. Like if I'm travelling and I see um, or hear some Australians 
acting like idiots, I, I, I somehow feel guilty by association. Um, or if I'm in Australia, um, certain aspects of the culture really grate upon me. They really do my head in, and and I'm highly critical of them. Um, and I, I think that's true probably in any culture. The, the the most pointed criticisms will always come from insiders because it's much closer to the bone. But I like being an outsider in that regard here because I don't um, have to feel associated with anything, um, and I don't have to. Um, even, I don't have to partake of it in, in, in many of the social obligations that I don't like. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very introverted, actually, in that way. Uh, and, and I actually find that a real shock when I go back to Australia. I'm going back there in two weeks. And every time I go back to Australia, I feel like I'm, someone has changed the channel and now I can understand everything um, without even having to try to understand it. When, to the extent that I can understand things in time, I usually have to actively listen. But in Australia, it's like it's just there, and it's like someone's turned the volume up, changed the channel, and turned the volume up, and it's really sort of in my face. Um, I don't like that. I like to very much sort of be in my own head. Um, but nevertheless, some people don't like that. Some people are very extroverted, and they very much want to belong to, to part of something, and so they struggle with being an outsider. Um, and the notion that... that um, Taiwan is not a proposition nation and that most Taiwanese will never regard them as being Taiwanese. Um, that's kind of a shock to people who have been raised on all this uh, multiculturalism and all this other sort of general um, globalist left-wing nonsense. Uh, it's a shock to them that not everyone in the world is um, doing that, committing cultural suicide. And, and they're not willing to just uh, say anyone can come in here and take over. Um, it's not for me. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a reactionary. Uh, and then the final con, I would say, um, is to do with raising children. I have a child, and um, my wife is Taiwanese, so he's mixed. I can imagine that it would be difficult to raise um, children here if, if one of the parents weren't Taiwanese, and even if if they were. I mean, he's, our son is a, he's less than five months old, so we're yet to really fully um, experience all of this. Generally, people, they're, they're really nice, actually, to mixed kids. They think they're really um, sort of wonderful. They're, they're very exotic, and people, all, they all want to touch them and tell you how cute they are and all this sort of stuff. Um, the issues, I think, ex that exist for raising children here are, firstly, the education system. My wife and I don't plan to send our kids through the education system here. Um, we plan to homeschool our kids. Uh, but basically, you know, it is very much about road learning, um, and I, I don't think it's actually that good, really, in some ways. I mean, they perform well on international tests, but I still think it's inadequate. It's better than a lot of what's going on in the West at the moment, but it's by no means close to perfect. Um, in some places, they have um, Steiner schools and Montessori schools, so, of course, you know, you can imagine the kinds of people who send their kids there, right? Um, you know, it, it, that, that would be liberal hell. Um and some people end up sending their kids to international schools or they, they send their kids to local schools that are a little bit more lax. Um, but nevertheless, education, I can see that could be a problem, um, especially as the kids get older, say at high school age. Um, that is often a, a make or break point for people who have been living in Taiwan, even for quite a long time, even if they've been living in Taiwan for a, a decade or two at that point. Um, they will, they will leave Taiwan because they want their kids to attend high school in the West. Um, the, next, the next kind of issue, I think, with raising kids in Taiwan is the, um, the physical environment. Because there's such population density and so on, uh, I, think, I think that could be a bit of a... Well, I mean, it's not really an issue, but I think... I would like my kids to be able to have... Um, something of the childhood that I had when I used to get on a bike and basically disappear until dinner time, um, that kind of thing, and, you know, get up to all sorts of mischief. Um, and that's one of the reasons I live in the countryside. Um, but, you know, kids in big cities, they don't really do that. And even if you take... If you go to a park, you know, every man and his dog's at the park. Um, so, you know, kids can't sort of just go out and be kids a lot of the time because of the man-made environment. So I, I think that's a, a drawback or a con. Uh, and then finally, um, there can be issues with the kids basically being separated from their culture or, or half of their culture, half of their identity or something like that. 
Um, you know, I mean, I guess they assimilate if they don't do that. Um, but I, I think in this day and age, English is really important. And I've actually met a lot of mixed kids in Taiwan who have had atrocious English, really atrocious English. Um, maybe I'll tell some stories about this another time of that, you know, and, and I've sort of spoken to the parents about this, um, you know, sort of asked them some questions about, you know, what they do or don't do with their kids. Um, and it really boggles my mind that, that parents would be like that with their kids. Um, you know, in one, in one case, I, I used to know a guy whose daughter um, was sort of middle of her class in school, in English class. And he's, he's American, this guy. There were basically a whole bunch of Taiwanese kids in, in a, not in Taipei, not in a, an area where there are tons of professionals and so on. Just average Taiwanese kids who were better at English than his daughter, which is mind-boggling, really. Um, now, I'm, I'm sort of making efforts not to do that. I mean, I've been reading to my son since he was about three months old. Um, he doesn't understand. He, he reacts. But, you know, I'm, I'm very much... Um, trying to make a, a, a concerted effort so that he doesn't grow up speaking Chinglish, so that he can read really well and write really well, and um, so that he knows a lot about, well, not just Western culture, but all sorts of stuff to do with history and so on from all over the world. I just generally want him to be smart and, and erudite. Um, but many people don't do that here, and obviously there are barriers there, um, as there are for anyone raising kids in another country. But anyway, those are all of the cons that I could think of for Taiwan. Some are um, more significant than others. I hope this hasn't come off as being too negative, as I stated at the beginning. I, I wanted to give a sort of a fair assessment, or a, um, I, and I realise this is much longer than the, the, the pros, but often that's the case when you talk about the negatives with something. You have to go into more depth at times. So I hope this hasn't come off as too negative. I do quite like living in Taiwan. I think it's going to be my home for a while. But I wanted to um, show that it wasn't all um, a ball of cherries. All right. Thanks for listening.